Phil um, has uh, gone a circuitous route to get to where he is now in terms of uh, being an author of having written six books, you know, including this uh, latest book. Uh, he uh, did undergraduate at uh, Carnegie Mellon and then ended up in customer support at Sony, uh, talking to people about problems with their camcorders uh, recording their uh, uh, kids' birthday parties. Um, decided that was not the right place to be and uh, did a graduate degree at Cornell, after which he ended up in human resources, which was also not the right place to be. Um, then uh, ended up uh, doing something related to human resources, but more on the technology side, working on PeopleSoft implementations uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and then became a, a full-time consultant after that, uh, leading uh, him to write uh, six books now um, and becoming a speaker, uh, traveling the world, um, and spending time with uh, smart people all over the place. Um, so his last book is um, titled The Visual Organization, Data Visualization, Big Data, and the Quest for Better Decisions. Very long title, but um, I think it covers uh, key topics and some of the key topics that uh, uh, we work on, obviously, here, and that's why Netflix became a um, uh, prime example in uh, Phil's book. Um, you know, when he uh, summarizes the book, he talks about the world, the world today, uh, requiring different tools, and one that let people find the needles buried, buried in the haystacks, uh, understanding immense and dynamic data sets, and ultimately making better decisions. Um, and he talks about Netflix as being uh, a quintessential visual organization and being ahead of many others when it comes to uh, using the tools of visualizing data that help us uh, make decisions. So, Phil, why don't you tell us uh, what, from what other companies we could learn things, perhaps. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Happy Monday, Netflix. Right after lunch, so the food coma kicks in. Huh? I'll keep it interesting. I hope. I'm Phil, and I've written a bunch of books. I did take a circuitous route to get here, but I think it's the right one. At a high level, I focus on the intersection of business, people, data, and technology, and how they all kind of connect. Written a bunch of books, and when I'm not writing, I'm usually speaking and helping companies with technology. And also, as I'll mention in a little while, I'm a big fan of the show Breaking Bad. And yes, I actually went as Heisenberg with the meth suit for Halloween. It wasn't much of a stretch with my look. I like to give away books when I can, and Leslie has been really helpful with setting up this event and, and yours as well with the research for the book. First person who gets this gets a free signed book. What is this? Yes, first tweet. Come on up. Or I can come to you. <laughs> this is the first tweet. This is from one of the Twitter. Here you go. Enjoy. Thank you. One of the Twitter co-founders, Jack Dorsey. And I'll bring up the tweet in a moment, but if you notice, there were uh, some changes. It's no longer Twitter, TTR. This is the tweet here, and it is from, oh gosh now, almost eight years ago. Interesting that I, when I grabbed this screenshot the other night, it had been favored over 21,000 times and retweeted 23,000 times. And in the book, I write extensively about how Netflix uses big data in ways that, quite frankly, other organizations don't even approach. Um, I'm not here to talk explicitly about Netflix. I did that a few hours ago, but you guys are doing it really, really well. In fact, of all my Netflix stats, my favorite one is that Netflix is responsible for one-fifth of the US weeknight internet traffic. One -third. I'm sorry, one-third. You're right, one-third. <laughs> That's a big difference. Um, so Netflix does big data really well. But let's focus here on Twitter. Roughly 240 million users, 20% uh, of whom are in the United States. Has anyone not heard of Twitter? And if you haven't and you're raising your hand, you're probably a little embarrassed. Okay. Now, in the eight years since Dorsey's first tweet, we've gotten today to a point at which we send more than, on average, 400 million tweets a day. Has anyone ever read Nick Bilton's book, Hatching Twitter, came out a few months ago? Highly recommend it. Um, I actually believe they're turning it into a movie. Um, it was very um, Machiavellian, a lot of backstabbing and politicking, but really interesting story on how Twitter uh, was started. And today, Twitter sports a market cap of around $27 billion. You hear me okay in the back? Good? More interesting Twitter facts has helped cause the overthrow of some long-standing dictatorships, particularly Arab Spring of a few years ago. 
and it, I would argue, has revolutionized global communication. It's sort of become this global town square. Here's where I'm going to geek out a little bit. Each tweet contains roughly 31 pieces of metadata. Now, some of this stuff is obvious, right? You've got time, you've got date, you've got location, if you've enabled that on your phone, and things like hashtags, which, by the way, in one of my previous books, The Age of the Platform, I focus on Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google and how they've redefined business. Many people don't know that the hashtag did not ship with the first version of Twitter. A guy by the name of Chris Messina, who also attended Carnegie Mellon, essentially created the hashtag. Right? Ditto with the retweet button that did not ship with native Twitter. So companies like Twitter understand that as much data as they generate, as innovative as they are, it makes sense to look at users and how they're developing the product, how they're using it. So these four pieces of data, I would argue, are, are pretty much table stakes. Here's where it gets fun. Other pieces of metadata include the field, withheld copyright. In other words, you know that if a government has marked this tweet as potentially libelous or dangerous or anything like that. Has it raised red flags? Or is it a potential copyright violation? But even then, we can be a bit more granular. Which countries has it been blocked or withheld? And then, is this potentially sensitive information? Now, these are, in some cases, binaries, right? It's either blocked or it isn't. It's either banned or a country or it isn't. But as I'm going to show you in a bit, there are some really interesting ways to visualize some Twitter data. We've gone from a point at which Jack Dorsey sends a single tweet with, I don't know, six, eight words, a few characters, to now 400 million a day, which, if I'm not mistaken, is around 15 billion a year. That's a lot of data. So these 140 characters can tell us a great deal. Here's a pretty cool data viz of some recent tweets based on what's happening in the Ukraine. Again, because Twitter has GPS information, we can see where there are some explosions. I find it interesting that a lot of these are in Europe, and then you have what appears to be either New York or Washington, D.C. Now, in a way, that makes sense, right? Because if you're in the body politic, you're discussing what's going on in the world. Um, this is just one example of a visualization from Twitter. Now, I'm going to give away another book here. Does anyone know the record for the current retweets? I'll take either. It was. It was, uh, you got yourself a book. The Ellen Selfie that night was retweeted 780,000 times. It is up now to, I believe, 3.4 million. And yes, I actually did a retweet during that. It broke, Ellen broke Twitter. Um, as an aside, it's much more difficult to break Twitter and to see the fail well. I went back, recently back in February, hit the five-year anniversary of my first tweet. And it was book-related. And in the book, I write about how, since I work from home as a writer, the line between working and not working is, is very blurry. But we, in Twitter, we used to see the fail whale quite a bit. Twitter was built on Ruby on Rails, which I'm assuming from some of the techies here, you know that that's sort of this open source backend architecture. But around 2010, when Twitter started to blow up, the guys had a decision to make, and the VCs as well. Are we in this for the long term, or do, should we just sell out, right, and get acquired by Google or something? And they decided that they're in it for the long term. As such, they moved away from Ruby and into something called Scala, which could handle millions of tweets a day, and, and Ruby necessarily couldn't. Give away one more book. I'll take either the number or the person. Who is the most followed on Twitter? Obama. Not Obama. Katy Perry. Katy Perry. <laughs> Why do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can work a few more in because Leslie was kind enough to um, provide a few extra books. But it's Katy Perry, and now she has roughly 52 million followers. Twittercounter.com. Again, Twitter understands the value of an ecosystem, not just in terms of innovation, but in terms of data. Uh, researching the fourth book, I came across some really interesting uses of Twitter, one of which, and I'm dating myself here, is called, um, I don't even know if it's still around, Twapper Keeper. If you remember the Trapper Keepers, 
right? You keep the information, so there's Twapper Keeper, there are all sorts of different tools for Twitter. And they generate a lot of data, they cut it in different ways. Again, Twitter works with a relatively open API application programming interface, essentially a way to link different devices and pull data, although recently a lot of developers have been particularly critical of Twitter because they've started to lock down their API a bit more. It's not as developer friendly. More interesting facts, and this leads to the potential with data visualization. Twitter is responsible for 30% of global social sharing. I find that interesting, right? Because even if you just take, say, Facebook with 1.2 billion users, even though I doubt that number, and 240 from Twitter, it's not a linear relationship. In other words, people share more. Um, I'll tell my parents that I've tweeted, I think, 18,000 times in five years, and that seems to be a very big number. Well, I've been active on Twitter for five years, right? 365 days a year, five years, 1,800 days, give or take, 10 times a day. Eh, that's not so obscene, right? So one-third essentially of all media shares. 30% of airtime tweets are sent during commercials. I find that interesting. This is why a lot of brands are embracing the two-screen experience. Two Super Bowls ago, a lot of people remember the power failure and how Oreo was able to generate millions of dollars in essentially free publicity by taking advantage of the fact that the power was out and created a hashtag, right? Our dunks never fail or something like that. And people who know about, more about advertising than I do believe that that was extremely beneficial for Oreo. This number is amazing. According to VentureBeat, Twitter can support 18 quintillion accounts. Now, if you've got 7 billion people on the planet, and let's say every one of them has an internet connection, according to my math, every person could can maintain over 2.6 billion accounts. That's big data. So with all this information, how do you make sense of it? My previous book is called Too Big to Ignore the Business Case for Big Data. And in that book, I describe big data, right? Sort of big data 101. What is it and why does it matter? And in that book, I touch upon data visualization, but I knew that there was much more to say about the subject and it could fit into a reasonably sized book. I read a really interesting blog post a couple weeks ago about how data visualization is the front end of big data. And I really like that notion. In other words, no one's going to stare at billions of records, right? But if we can visualize it, we start to make sense of it. And while we were researching the book, I came across an extremely talented guy in Spain, a data visualization expert called Santiago Ortiz. And he's Mobio on Twitter. And actually, I specifically used Twitter while researching this book to get a random sample of people doing interesting things. I can Google as well as the next guy. But to be exposed to random encounters, I think, is, is really fascinating. Uh, one of my favorite tweets and retweets sort of conversations is between Kanye West and T. Boone's Pickens. And T. Boone's Pickens is a big oil magnate. And Kanye had tweeted, the first million's the toughest. And out of nowhere, T. Boone's Pickens writes, no, the first billion is. So for those two guys to be interacting in a public space, I think is pretty random. So what kind of connections can you see? And Santiago Ortiz had done a great deal of work on visualizing data with Twitter. And he polled online about 100,000 tweets from February of 2013 to February 22nd, 2013. And with that information, he was able to create not only the sort of static picture, but a really dynamic and interactive visualization of networks. Now, this isn't just random tweets from random people. He actually pulled, at the time, a publicly available list on Twitter employees. There are about 1,250 employees, and he scraped 100,000 tweets. And he discovered while looking at this information that there were natural patterns that emerged in terms of communication. You could see things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. Um, interestingly, some of the guys from Twitter, his friends, took a look at this tool and opened it up on a larger data set. Twitter quickly pulled that list. I don't know why, but my hunch is that it probably made it really easy for recruiters to poach employees, although with LinkedIn, that's not that hard either. And Twitter had made a couple of acquisitions, and the Twitter employees using Santiago's tool were able to see how those acquisitions were going. In other words, were these new employees being integrated into the company? 
right? Or were they just communicating with themselves? Also, how were departments communicating with each other? And this was just one use out there. There are some absolutely fascinating data visualizations out there on Twitter, and this is one of them. Um, for example, it's possible to recognize international Twitter teams like Japan and the UK, as I said, in addition to individual relationships with marketing. So this is just one example with Twitter. Again, it generates a lot of data. By visualizing it, you get a deeper sense of what going, what's going on. In the book, I make the point that this isn't necessarily about finding a simple answer, but the interactive tools allow employees to ask better questions. A couple hours ago, I was over at Autodesk, also featured in the book. And when I was researching the book, I came across a guy by the name of Justin Macheka over in Toronto, Canada. And he had created a really neat tool for data visualization of employee movement. This looks like it's something from space. Autodesk has about 7,000 employees. And they frequently acquire companies. And like any large organization, experiences movement. Right? People leave the company. People are promoted. People transfer. And Justin did something really neat. He created something called the organic org chart, or org, org chart. And you can see, I've simplified it here, but you can go online on YouTube, just type in org org chart and go nuts. But you can see how employees are moving in the company over a four year period. Now, as yours was mentioning before I started writing books, I used to design reports for organizations. I used to help them move from one system to another. And in the process, I would create a bunch of reports. I've literally created thousands of reports for companies, many of which actually show employees going from department A, department B, or attrition rates, things like that. Um, I never created anything remotely this cool. Now, I've slowed it down, and I couldn't get the whole thing in, but this looks like it's something out of space. In the center is the CEO of Autodesk. But we see new departments forming. We see people transferring reorgs. That's probably the best use of this. You see how dramatic the organization changed as a result of a reorganization. So this is just another tool that people can use to interact with data. You can go forward. You can go backward. You can pause it. You can zoom in. It's a really cool interactive tool. In the book, I make the point that KPIs and dashboards and static reports aren't going anywhere. Right? This era of big data, the democratization of data viz tools like the ones I'm showing, don't mean that you will never look at a register again or a P&L statement. Those things, of course, matter. But I also argue that those tools don't necessarily promote data discovery. In other words, when one of my clients used to ask me, hey, Phil, can you write a report that does x? And I would say, yes, I can do that. Here's your report. But it just said x. The tools now have become so much more interactive that they can allow you to ask better questions of your data and to see things. I argue in the book that there's only so much that you can do with a static data viz. One of the reasons I would argue that Netflix is doing so well is that it has created quite a bit of information, but then it doesn't say, all right, try to make it work with an SQL statement. Right? You're given new tools, um, some of which I won't repeat here because some of you may have built them or work on them. But many of the tools that Netflix uses, to my knowledge, you couldn't buy off the shelf. So you have to build them. And that's what visual organizations, I would argue, do. They'll see what's out there. But if not, then they will build something. And Yoris and I were talking earlier about some of the different open source tools uh, like a D3. In fact, as I'll talk about in a little bit, um, it's even easy for someone like me, who's reasonably technical, but not certainly as technical as some of the people in this room, to create a really cool interactive data viz of his or her social data. And aside from identifying business opportunities, there also, I would argue, exists the potential with some of these tools to see if there's a potential problem. Does anyone remember Enron? Okay. This was one of the biggest disasters in American business history. It was an American energy company. And if those of you are more curious about it, there's a book by Bethany McLean and Joe Nocera called The Smartest Guys in the Room. They also turned it into a movie. Um, really interesting book about corporate greed and arrogance. Before it imploded, Fortune named it America's most innovative company for six consecutive years. Right? This company had a stellar reputation. But because it blew up, some of you might have to deal with Sarbanes-Oxley. You can blame Enron. Um, and as I mentioned, there's this book and movie about the company and how it exploded. Um, one of the companies I feature in the book is based here in um, San Francisco. And 
Note that this is retroactive. In other words, they weren't doing this prospectively, but they could do that in the future. They created a tool that allowed all of the emails to be visualized. And then if you see in the red here, this indicates that there's an external email threat. There is a cluster here of bankruptcy discussions. Imagine if someone had been using this tool ahead of time, say, wait a minute, why are these people saying one thing, but their private emails are telling us something totally different? Uh, I've seen a, a couple of these tools that are out there. Uh, and these were developed by proper techies. But as I mentioned, I start off the book talking about Twitter and how I tweet. And I mentioned earlier that I was a big fan of the show Breaking Bad. I was curious about how my tweets have evolved. I work from home. I like to think that I'm reasonably productive. But if I decide to slack off, no one's going to get me in trouble. But I used a tool called Visify that actually broke down my tweets. And you can see here that as my tweeting evolved, I started tweeting more with the hashtag of big data. right? And that kind of peaked when my fifth book came out, Too Big to Ignore. Up until the point at which I had a title for the book, I wouldn't tweet with that hashtag, right? It didn't exist. So that's the bottom one. But some of my other tweets have been relatively constant. With Breaking Bad, since I'm a fan, it doesn't surprise me that I have a fairly consistent pattern. My favorite rock group is Rush. Any Rush fans here? Give him a book. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and hand it up. Yeah. And then there are some tweets for my fourth book, The Age of the Platform. This was a tool that required no export. Twitter made its archives available for export in December of 2012. But if you go back 10, 15 years, how would you get this information in anything like this? Well, you would export it as a CSV. You would throw it into Excel or Access and parse it and blah, 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 and it would take a while. This took me, I don't know, 30 seconds, just connected to the API. Now, this is what I tweet. One of my other questions surrounded when I tweet. And I was curious because I'm a morning person. I tend to get up around 5, 5.30 in the morning for no particular reason. And I usually go straight to my computer and have a cup of coffee. Well, this is a very simple data viz on when I tweet. And it's fairly constant, but I, a couple things stand out to me. Um, I tweet early, but not that early. I don't really stay up late at night. When you get up at 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning like I do, you're usually not up at 2 in the morning. My tweets drop off around 10 o'clock in the morning. Because by that point, I've been up for four or five hours, and I feel like I should go to the gym and give my eyes a break. So this is just a simple data viz of how I tweeted. Now, it's funny because literally the book had been out for a day when uh, I saw on the wire that uh, Yahoo had required Visify. So I sent a note over to uh, Todd Silverstein, who's one of the co-founders of Visify, and say, all right, I figure I'm due about a third of whatever money you got, right? Because clearly my book was the reason. Right? And it wasn't. It's just a cool tool. But my point is that there has never been an easier time to learn things from your data. And this was a free tool required very little work on my part. If you could select authorize API, you could create something like this. But we're living in this world of big data, and the tools, fortunately, are getting better. I start the book off. Let's do another book giveaway. Anyone know who this is? This is a little obscure. You might get two books if you get this one. Hey, give him a book. Nice. Two books. <laughs> give him two books. Uh, who said that? OK. You get two. Give one away. Christian Chalot is a very smart guy. He is also the co-founder and currently the CEO of Tableau Software. And I start the book off with a little bit of an ode to Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two IPOs. A year to the day after, almost, it was 364 days after the Facebook IPO, and we all know how that went, right? Started at 42, trading was suspended. People literally didn't know if they had purchased Facebook stock. At the end of the day, it was down to 28, so it lost a third of its value. Now, Facebook's fine, right? When you're dropping $19 billion on WhatsApp, you're doing OK. But Tableau went public in this very uncertain environment, right? Say what you will about Facebook. The IPO cast a pall over the market. People weren't sure about what to do. So Tableau goes public almost a year to the day after Facebook did. Now, whereas Facebook dropped by a third, Tableau jumped 63%. Now, here's the thing about Tableau. It's exclusively a database company. They do nothing else. 
Now, it's not the only data viz vendor out there, far from it. Companies like Microsoft and SAP and Oracle, MicroStrategies, right? all these companies do data viz to some extent, but I don't think they break it out. If you looked at Microsoft's financials, I would be astonished if more than 1% of all revenue came from something that would qualify as data viz, right? unless you want to get technical with definitions of Excel and PowerPoint. Oh, I start off the book by explaining this may, in fact, signal the dawn of the visual organization. When a data viz company is worth $2 billion, that's a signal. And I would argue that it's a real $2 billion. Tableau has, I believe, I'm speaking there later this week, 15,000 customers. The benefit to a lot of large, smaller organizations is that you don't have to be a company the size of Netflix or Autodesk to use it. Because of the cloud, because of software as a service, it's never been more affordable for companies to say, use this on a much more affordable basis. I'm old enough to remember implementing enterprise type BI tools, business intelligence, that would take a year and year and a half and the contracts cost millions of dollars. And Tableau is relatively affordable, but there are all sorts of open source tools that I use in the book like D3. Anyone here use D3 just out of curiosity? Okay, decent number. So it's a very powerful open source tool. Now, by open source, people think it's free. And yes and no, right? Think free speech, not free beer, as they say. Just because you can download it doesn't mean you know how to use it. So I was thinking about a lot of these questions. In this era of big data, how do we make sense of all of it? Right? How are progressive companies like Netflix, like Autodesk, turning this data into actual insights? Because this isn't a contest, right? He with the most data doesn't win. When I hear people saying, oh, we've got 60 gig, or we've got a petabyte, well, that's wonderful. What are you actually doing with it? Are you asking better questions? Are you finding the needles in the haystack? And most important, what can we learn from these companies? Now, data viz isn't just happening within a corporate environment. I would argue that data and data viz are absolutely everywhere. In my previous book, Too Big to Ignore, I covered the explosion of, of data. Now, when most people think of data, they think of a transactional table, list of paychecks, list of employees, right? That's the structured kind, go, go nuts in Excel. But around 85% of all data being generated these days is actually unstructured. So it's a YouTube video, it's a photo, it's a bunch of text on a blog. But we are generating a tremendous amount of information. But it isn't just inside of companies. It isn't just the visual employee. We are seeing a more visual consumer. And I'm going to show you a picture on that in a bit. Has anyone ever been to data.gov? OK, a few people. I'm old enough to remember that it was, used to be very difficult to get any sort of information from the government. Now there's an increasing amount of open or linked data that's out there. People are creating some really cool data visualizations. I saw one recently since I'm in San Francisco that visualized traffic in San Francisco or transit patterns as on the basis of tweets. Because remember, they're capturing GPS. We're also seeing a more visual citizen. And as I'll talk about in a bit, a more visual journalist. Anyone here ever hear of Nate Silver? OK, a few hands. Uh, Nate Silver made being a geek kind of cool. And we're seeing a more visual athlete. Um, these are just a few things that went through my head. Around nine months ago, I was in Manhattan keynoting a conference on big data and healthcare. And I'm walking to the event, trying to get there early. And I stop because I see this dry cleaner. And this dry cleaner, pretty low tech business from what I understand, certainly compared to Netflix, created a simple bar chart of its Yelp reviews. And I took this picture and said, something is happening here when a dry cleaner says, this is a very effective way to communicate how our customers feel about us. Now, this dry cleaner was a merchant. And as a Yelp merchant, you have access to certain tools. But the vast majority of data on Yelp is generated by people like us in this room. So I went into Yelp and started playing around with my own data. And here's a simple chart of my own reviews by location. Most of them have taken place in Las Vegas. I've lived there for the last two and a half years. But before that, I lived in West Caldwell, New Jersey. In my travels, I've been to Secaucus and Portland and other places, but sometimes I didn't feel compelled to write a Yelp review. I had a good experience, for example, when I was in South Korea. I just didn't put anything on Yelp. So this is just one way that we are seeing data visualized all the time. But you can cut the Yelp data any number of different ways. Here's a separate cut of that data based on my type of review. In other words, location here doesn't matter. I tend to review a lot of restaurants and hotels. But it looks like I have gone off on an um, automotive company or maybe had good things to say. The point here is that this isn't necessarily this, 
amazing data viz. The point here is that we are seeing data as part of our everyday lives. Do you have any more books to give away? Someone's going to get this one. Who's this? Ray Allen. Ray Allen. Is that you? OK. Uh, whoever said it first, I, I heard a couple people. But I heard it from here first. It was right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah OK. Here you go. <laughs> Ray Allen is the all-time NBA three-point leader. And right now, he's playing backup two guard for the Miami Heat, except when Dwayne Wade is injured and he starts. Anyone ever read the book Moneyball or seen the movie? OK, don't you see a number of people? We are seeing nothing short of a revolution in sports, and not just in terms of new statistics, but the way that NBA teams are planning. This is a shot chart for Ray Allen, and NBA teams use this quite a bit. Um, the GM for the Houston Rockets, Daryl Morey, was previewed about a year and a half ago in Sports Illustrated about the advanced analytics that the Rockets are doing. Here's a similar chart to what they would use. This is a breakdown of Ray Allen's chart, uh, shots in the NBA. Now, you can see that there are some red clusters there. That's not a coincidence. Allen goes to those points specifically. They run plays to put him there because he has a very high percentage of, of making them and the three-pointers. Think about it. You don't see around the uh, 17, 15, uh, 16, 17 foot mark, a lot of data points. Why? Because if you're Ray Allen and you have a 38, 39% chance of making a three-pointer, why move in two feet for a two-pointer? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes, your percentage goes up, but the output, right, the value is 50% higher at as a three-pointer. And NBA teams are doing all sorts of this with visual information. Uh, all sorts of things I've read since the book have come out about companies like SportsView that are putting sensors on athletes with teams to track where they are on the court. We are really just getting started in this new wave of analytics. It's absolutely fascinating. But this isn't just in sports. I think we got one more book. Who's this? Elon Musk. Guy in the hat, Elon Musk. Anyone see the 60 Minutes piece last night on Elon Musk? Thought it was interesting. Here you go. I didn't think I'd give away 10. And Musk was on Siski Minutes last night talking about Tesla and SpaceX. Uh, Musk is a lot of things. He's also the inspiration for the Tony Stark character in the Iron Man movies. He also sits on the board of Solar Energy Company. So he's an active guy. And here, he's talking about Tesla. About a year ago, Musk made some claims about battery life and mileage and how good the Tesla was. Not the first CEO to do that. A New York Times journalist by the name of John Broder said, let's see if these are actually true. But he didn't write an opinion piece. He literally collected data. He very meticulously drove and counted his miles, where he charged, when he stopped, how fast he was going. Long story short, Broder strongly suggested that Musk's claims were nonsense. Now, if this were a 15-year-old with a Tumblr blog, Musk isn't going to care. When you write for the New York Times, you have a slightly larger audience than most 15-year-olds with a Tumblr blog. I never saw, and I'm sure it's happened, but I can't recall, a CEO of a company and a reporter arguing over data. How did you collect it? I mean, very specific. Oh, this notion that journalists are somehow exempt from data is largely being, I think, disproven. And people like Nate Silver are showing that. There's a reason that at one point, Nate Silver, who made all these predictions about the presidential election and the con uh, congressional elections, at one point, Silver drove something like 20% of New York Times traffic all by himself. So his data-oriented approach was really resonating with people. So in this era of big data, I said to myself, well, where are all the case studies? Mine is not the first book on data visualization. In the book, I write about how guys like Edward Tufte and Stephen Hugh and Nathan Yao have done a great deal of work on data visualization. In fact, when some people say to me, so you're an expert now, you wrote a book. I really don't like the term expert all that much. One of my favorite quotes is from Frank Lloyd Wright, who said, an expert doesn't need to think because he knows everything. Uh, I like to think I know enough to be dangerous, but this book takes a different approach than some of the other data books, data viz books that are out there. When I was 19 at Carnegie Mellon, I remember being exposed to Tufte's book, VDQI, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. But when I started searching for data visualization case studies, I didn't find too many. In fact, of the 23 results I found on Google on August 31st, 2013, several were from me going, where are all the data viz case studies? Contrast that with ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, back offices, HR, financials. There were thousands of them. 
CRM, customer relationship management. There are even more than that. So in this book, I strongly endeavored to not just talk about what companies could do with data visualization, but what companies were actually doing. And to that end, yours was really helpful. Um, it's not easy getting companies to talk because I set the bar very high. I didn't want puff pieces from PR folks or marketing people. Oh, sure, we think we can do X, Y, and Z. I wanted actual examples. Now, it's easy to sit at a company like Netflix or Autodesk and say, you're doing it right. Um, but you have, I believe, a very strong appreciation for the importance of data and a lot of employees. But it sort of begs the question, do you have to be a $27 billion company to do good things with data? And I'd argue the answer is no. One of the companies I reference in the book is called Wedgies. And they're a social polling company with six people based in Las Vegas. They're great guys. We saw Anchorman 2 together. It was a blast. Um, they understand the importance of data viz in two fundamental ways. When you create a wedgie through Twitter, it takes about 20 seconds. And in the book, I write about how I created a couple of them. But one of them was, um, who's the more despicable New York politician, Elliot Spitzer or Anthony Weiner? Weiner won. A six-person company not only builds visuals into its polling product, so a static JPEG, but they allow people to add animated GIFs, which may sound sort of cheesy, but they're actually very engaging. That's on the front end. On the back end, they use very simple tools like Google Analytics and some more sophisticated ones like D3 to understand what's happening in their business in real time. In the book, I discuss a NASCAR poll that a USA Today reporter had created. And the question was, do you like racing on dirt roads? I'm not a big NASCAR fan, but from what I understand, people typically race on concrete or some facsimile thereof. That poll wound up generating a lot of traffic. Now, Wedgies works off of AWS, Amazon Web Services. If things are blowing up, they need to know about that because they might have to up their provisioning. What's more, Wedgies has built its architecture in such a way that if it does go from a six-person company to a 60 or 600 or 6,000-person company, it wouldn't have to blow anything up. It's building its product in very visual ways. What are the characteristics of a visual organization? Well, they eschew this notion of set it and forget it. And in 2004, I went to a company when I was still consulting before I started writing and speaking, and I built them a very simple ETL tool. ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. You're taking data from one system, you're noodling with it, and you're loading it into another one. I built this tool. It wasn't terribly sophisticated. It was in Microsoft Access. Five years later, the same utility company calls me back. Says, hey, Phil, we got a job for you to upgrade our systems. Can you come down? I lived in New Jersey. They were nice people. The rate was decent. I drove down there. And I'm looking at this woman's screen. And I see something very similar to what I would have designed. And I said, ah, you've got great design skills. And she goes, thanks. You built it. <laughs> So I had two questions for her. Does it still work? Answer, yes. Good for me. And then, did you tweak it at all? Answer, no. Because see question one. That's very different if you're moving data A uh, from point A to point B. But visual organizations understand the importance of supplemental data sources. Three, four years ago, companies started to get their arms around social data, right? Whether it was Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. OK, where, where's the signal in this noise? And then Pinterest comes out of nowhere. And some people go, oh, gosh, I don't want to deal with that. I'm still struggling with Facebook and LinkedIn. Well, visual organizations understand that even though 99% of that data may be noise, there still may be a signal there. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the Pinterest engagement numbers, they're off the chart. So if you ignore that, you sort of do so at your own peril. This notion of data discovery and data exploration, I would argue, is absolutely essential. You don't know necessarily what you're going to find. I have a real problem with people who say, well, we're not going to do anything with Hadoop or with big data in general until we can figure out the ROI. Really? Who's going to predict the future? How do you know what you're going to find? And many companies focus more on the costs of action, what will we spend, versus the costs of inaction. So this notion of an ROI, I think, is completely misplaced. Now, cool data viz tools like some of the ones I've showed before do not obviate the need for dashboards, for KPIs, for standard reports, as I mentioned. But I would argue that they don't encourage true data discovery. They don't let people interact necessarily and ask better questions. Now, when you guys built the tool, 
to quantify the colors for the movie imagery that I write about in the book. From what I read on the blog, talking to yours, that's not something that you bought off the shelf. Right? You built it because you thought that it would be useful. And again, that's very typical of what I consider a data, a visual organization to be. So these are the characteristics, but what are the myths? What's really inhibiting many companies from making this jump? First, this notion that they have to visualize all the data. I think that's nonsense. You're never going to get all the data. I think it's virtually impossible. I did a tech cocktail interview a couple of weeks ago, and the last question was, Phil, how do you visualize data? I say, not as much as I'd like. Why? Well, I'm an author. Amazon makes certain tools available to me, one of which is a pretty cool heat map. In other words, I can see that in San Francisco, hopefully people are buying a bunch of my books. In Seattle, New York, DC. I don't get much action in Alabama for whatever reason. Now, I know that data at an aggregate level, but I can't export that. I can't play with it. I can't say, you're buying my book. Hey, I have a new one coming out. Would you like to buy it? Why, why would I? Then I wouldn't need Amazon. So even though I don't have all of the data, I still think there are tools out there that help me understand what to do. For example, if I knew that I were popular in Seattle, then maybe I'd tweak my Google AdWords such that I pay more for Seattle than I do someplace where they're not buying my book. Next up, many organizations only visualize good data. Again, I think that's a huge mistake. Um, I would argue that many times it's easiest to see an outlier if it's visualized. Yes, if you sort your data in Excel, you can see that someone's making $2 million a year and the max for that salary is 50000 But when it's visualized, you start to see things. This is not a book about how the human brain works, but when I was researching this topic, I discovered that depending on the data and depending on the brain, we recognize data in a visual format anywhere from 60 to 60,000 times as fast. Now, just because we see it doesn't necessarily mean that it will manifest the right course of action. As I write in the book, in many cases, we can simply ask better questions of our data. And it doesn't necessarily lead to the right decision. The old Mark Twain quote still applies. There are lies, damn lies, and statistics. I remember when I was 19 taking that course on empirical research at Carnegie Mellon, and I saw the Edward Tufte book, I was astonished on how a very volatile stock with a couple tweaks to the X and the Y axes could look pretty stable. Or you can make a very stable company stock look very erratic. So this notion that big data or data visualization will lead to certainty, again, I think is a bit off. Oh, some of the lessons from the book. A user experience, participation matters. I have spent a lot of time in my career working on IT projects in which IT built something without a whole lot of input from the users. And then when they rolled it out, the users didn't understand how to use it. That's a problem. This is no longer 1998. I would argue that no longer do we need to always go to the IT department to get the data. I would also argue that it shouldn't be IT's job to be responsible for the data. It's really generated by the users. It's also important to experiment. Visual organizations have their tools evolve with time. We don't see companies like that utility that have a tool that works for six years without being tweaked. It's important to walk before you run. This is my fourth talk now on the new book. And in the first couple, when I talked about Netflix and what you were doing with visualizing the colors and turning that into information that helps your algorithm, I saw some really quizzical looks on the faces of the audience members or when I talk about what Google does. Well, think about this. Netflix can't do today, I'm sorry, can do today things that it could not do five years ago. Same thing with Google. They're constantly tweaking their algorithm. So you don't go from zero to Google or zero to Netflix overnight. Next up, it's important to avoid what I call the quarterly visualization mentality. At far too many organizations I've seen in my career, people will only visualize data for a quarterly report, for an annual meeting. I think that the most interesting things can be found from employees who are asking really basic questions and visualizing their data. Well, what if we cut it this way? Yes, sometimes you can create a very static data viz on a small amount of data, and that is fine. It's simple. You don't need to overcomplicate it. But if you're dealing with petabytes of unstructured data, uh, you can't necessarily get away with that in Excel. One of the other case studies in the book is on the University of Texas, and they use a, pro a program called SAS Visual Analytics. Now, here's the interesting thing about Texas. They don't just make the data available for employees. 
or for University of Texas alumni. But anyone with an internet connection can go to the University of Texas productivity dashboard and play with data. Maybe you're curious about what acceptance rates are for PhD programs. Maybe you can cut that by a minority. Maybe you can cut that by some other demographic variable. Stuart Brand once famously said that all information wants to be free. Uh, that may or may not be true, but we're certainly seeing, like I mentioned before, with data.gov, with open data, linked data, more data is becoming available. Um, it's a very big subject. Next up, you don't need all data to begin. Uh, again, I think that's completely a myth. And then finally, it's important to iterate. Uh, you want the feedback from the people who are actually be using this. Uh, one of the questions at Autodesk was, what if you've got this really cool data viz, but it doesn't tell me anything? It's artistic, it's cool, but it doesn't help me in my job. Um, I would argue that if you're asking people for input early on, because certain tools, I would argue, still need to be designed by hardcore techies. But as I mentioned before, tools like Tableau, right out of the box, can connect to uh, many different data sources. So you may wind up in a different place, or you may get there in a different area. 